Wow. Okay, sorry about that. Thank you for... <laughs> wow, okay, let me go back through this then. Sorry about that. Dang it, I forgot there's always... There's always two... <laughs> okay, sorry. All right, restarting. Sorry about that. I forgot there's always two layers. That's like a double protection thing for me, but... Um... Okay. Sorry, we will... Let me rewind my mind. <laughs> okay, so... Um, what you guys are seeing is the, uh, sorry about that, it's OBX, because there's a physical mute on the physical mic here, and then there's a digital mute on the, uh, on the OBX, OBS, whatever it's called. Okay, um, okay. Thanks, <laughs> thanks everybody. I'm embarrassed. All right, uh, it's okay, it happens to all of us. Um, okay, so, this is a maquette that I made in about a week's time, a little less than a week, uh, originally for um, a live Q&A that John Krasinski was giving um, here in LA uh, back on the 27th. And so I think I did one stream like a week ago or so that was showing the earlier process of this. And so now this is all finished and complete. Um, and it's, I would say it's, it's like 90% there as far as accuracy to what's in the film. And that's only 90% mostly because, well, A, partly a time, and then B, also just trying to match something that you're looking at in a movie and have only a few angles uh, in behind the scenes of the correct version or the final, you know, in-film version of the model. Uh, it didn't really, there are certain areas I just couldn't really view well and like cleanly. Um, namely, in, in particular, I was saying this earlier when I was muted, there's an area here, like a, a piece, an extra like kind of shell piece that sort of bridges off of these kind of like shoulder pad or like shoulder blade kind of um, bits. So there's an extra piece that kind of flares off of them, but I couldn't really get it right. I couldn't really view it accurately. So I just forewent that because it was very small and it would have come, come off the, it would kind of like come off this edge a bit kind of into the air and it could have really snapped easily. Um, cause I have a very, the, the, the print size that I gave to John was very small, unfortunately, but that's the only, I had to compensate for the amount of time it took me to accurately replicate the alien versus the amount of time I would have left over after I finished sculpting it to pose it, segment it, print it, prime it, and then disassemble it or, or, you know, assemble it, make sure it fits together and then put it into a, you know, a, a bubble wrapped, um, box so um i'm gonna blow up the my little camera screen here so you guys can actually uh see let me fix the camera here too um <laughs> all right okay and i see here okay so this is the I don't know what scale this would be. I guess in probably like one thirty fifth or something. I mean, it's it's small, unfortunately, and I hate giving people small things in general in this case because uh, it's so much better viewed, obviously, in larger scale. Um, but this is the physical three D print. We've got the title nicely down there in the base, and an embarrassing truth that happened too when I was creating this was um, in order to increase increase speed for three D printing. Uh, let me take this apart so I can show you guys just the base. Um, all right. So this is done in two pieces, as you can see. So there's like a, a clear line that's uh, delineated there. And when these pieces are printed, um, to increase speed, you want to do things that are as close against the build plate as possible. So when it's printing, it's actually printing like this, like upside down. And if you put flat pieces like this right against the build plate, which is what I did, uh, they'll print extremely fast because you only have you know this much distance to cover before your print is done. But the downside to that is that these are rather for the build volume, they're rather taking up a lot of they're rather large comparatively to the build plate, so they take up almost the entire build plate. Um, and also, then being that flat and large of a surface, you have to pry that off of this metal plate. And if there is any kind of um, extra adherence to the plate, it's going to create a problem for removing it, right? So that's why usually when you have even large, long, large, flat surfaces like this, you want to angle them, right? So you have them diagonally printing. So you have all these supports coming up to them. That's, what, that's how these were printed, this version. 
Um, but then this took about 10 hours just to print this small piece, um, taking both of these parts and printing them diagonally. Um, so let me see if I can, yeah. So this printed kind of like this and this one similarly, same angle, similar on the same build plate. Comes off really clean and nice. Um, but when you have no time and you want to print these against flat against the build plate, um, you have to pry them off. And so in the process of scraping them off, popping off these two pieces, uh, they cracked in like two different places. They were rather clean breaks. So I was able to like super glue them back together. And then of course glue these parts together. But I think one, one of the cracks was along this area. And then the other one was somewhere across here. And so we had these two diagonal cracks, put them back together, but they're both in areas where they interlock. And so when I put the pieces together, embarrassingly, uh, it doesn't, it didn't go together perfectly flat as it was designed, but instead it kind of had a warping, a slight bow. So now when it sits flat on a table, there's a little bit of this wobble to it, unfortunately. So embarrassing. I tried to explain some of this to him briefly, um, but I'm sure some of it just, you know, just went over his head because he was busy with a lot of other things. But anyway, we spoke for like, I don't know, a few minutes. It was great. You know, it was nice to meet him afterwards. And uh, it was just a pleasure to talk with him and be able to give him like a little letter just explaining, um, you know, what I appreciate about his his filmmaking and his, his tastes and his, um, you know, proclivities, blah, blah, blah. But yeah, it was just, it was cool to meet him, you know, and uh, be able to chat a little bit. So anyway, um, this is the small finished piece. And then I was able to do a larger one recently where you can kind of see a bit more detail. So I'll just pull that up quickly. Much bigger. This is the size I would have wanted to give him uh, had I had the time to print this. But I needed like an extra day or two really to... To print this in time but this is all like the same exact model just much much bigger um, i would say this is probably one tenth scale ish um but yeah you can see a lot better all the detail that you know was put into it digitally um let's see if it'll focus i don't know if the camera's gonna i think it's too fixated on a face rather than on on this i don't know that's probably the best focus we can get but anyway this is the um this is the finished 110 scale version, and it came out pretty good. I haven't primed it yet, so it has a little bit more of a translucency to it, um, kind of like a subsurface scattering. But, um, you know, I would say it's like 90% accurate to what's in the film. Also, like, the arm and the hands are posed a certain way because I wasn't sure until after seeing the second film. I wasn't sure exactly how the the wrist joint, because these are like long metacarpals, I wasn't sure how the... Uh, the area here from the radius and ulna would actually attach and how far of the um, extension they could do. And it looks like these can fully extend straight out. And so I was sort of trying to obey the rules of like a knee where a knee can only go straight, right? Now, if you hyperextend it, then you're breaking it basically. And so I wasn't sure exactly how that operated here, but it seems like these joints flex more like a proper wrist, but they just often keep them curled down as kind of like a, kind of like a gorilla. Um, so anyway, so there you go. This is a larger piece, and I'm going to post some photos of this and uh, have a video of this, um, a turntable of this in the making up video that I'm going to finish up here today and, and put on my uh, YouTube channel and elsewhere. So anyway, long explanation for a uh, an incredibly taxing <laughs> and rushed job, but um, it worked, you know, it, it came together in the end, and well, I'm glad at least I got to give him something, and it's something that was at least compact enough that he could fly back with because I know he had to fly from here to like I think he went to Austin and then I you know wherever else I think he's in London now I just saw like him and Edgar Wright were doing a, uh, a Q&A which is so cool because Edgar's awesome filmmaker too um, but JJ did his interview here JJ Abrams and um, I was thinking of making a uh, <laughs> I was thinking of cracking a joke but it's like you'd have to be a super film nerd and I'm not sure JJ would have appreciated it, but um, when I was listing off a bunch of different directors that I was likening John's work to when it comes to his work in A Quiet Place films, and uh, and some of my favorite directors like Spielberg, of course, and uh, Christopher Nolan and Peter Jackson, um, you know, I love great big adventures, and I love, that's how I think, that's the stories I love, that's the stories I'm working on writing myself. Um, I love great adventures with a lot of heart, all right, and that's, I think, largely what A Quiet Place is, is there a lot of intimacy with... There's a lot of intimacy with the family and the characters you care about, but there's also a really fascinating scenario that they're all thrown into. Um, and so it's done very well. So those are the kind of authors and, and filmmakers I'm always a fan of and style of films I enjoy, um, which really are not that common. They're not every day. You know, it's like we're lucky if we get one of those every three years or so, generally. Um, 
but when I was listing off all these different directors and then uh, John interjected and was like, and like J.J. Abrams. And I'm like, yes, of course, like J.J. Because I loved a lot of J.J.'s films as well. I wouldn't maybe put them in the top of all my favorite films, but they're definitely beloved films. Like I love Mission Impossible 3, Super 8. Um, I like the remakes that he's done in Star Trek. They were fun. Um, you know, I, I enjoyed Lost when that was out, you know, originally. Um, so there's definitely films he's made that, I, that I've enjoyed for sure. And really, like Mission Impossible 3 is like a big one for me. I really, I really love that one. Um, but I was thinking of cracking this joke of, <laughs> I almost said, but I'm like, nah, it's probably not, not the nicest thing to say. But it was all good fun. I would have said something like, uh, <laughs> yeah, JJ, your work is great. I mean, that that scene in regarding Henry, when you're handing Harrison Ford the pizza box, whew, I mean, how can you top that? <laughs> it's got, I mean, it's definitely, you know, sarcastic. But um, for those who don't know, there's a film starring Harrison Ford. And I think, I think Annette Benning, I forget if that's his wife, the actress. But anyway, it's a, it's a touching film. It's a good, it's a good movie. If you haven't seen it um, called Regarding Henry, Harrison Ford's the main star actor character. And J.J. Uh, Abrams guest did a little, <laughs> I think it was one of the only films he's been in, or at least the one that's most known. Uh, he was an actor. He was an extra, basically, and just he was a pizza boy. He was like the pizza delivery guy, and he hands Harrison. I think it's Harrison Ford. I haven't seen the movie in years, um, and it's hard to even find that clip of just that with him in there. But he's in the doorway, and Harrison Ford's character like just is confused because he he was shot in the head in the beginning of the movie, and then it's all about his recuperation and reassimilation and and reengagement in society. It's really it's a great film. I think it's a really it's a really touching, interesting story. Um, and it, it touches on mental health and, and mental healing and just all of that in a very poignant, very, very touching, intelligent way. Um, but yeah, he just walks past his character then after I think JJ's like waiting for payment or something. I forget. But anyway, it's hilarious because you see JJ all of a sudden in this movie that you're not expecting to see him in. So anyway, I was thinking of <laughs> I was thinking of cracking a joke about that. And it might have gone over well, but I don't know. A lot of people probably wouldn't have gotten it because you have to be kind of a bit of a nerd to uh, to know where a random occurrence of JJ is when he was like 18, maybe or 15. I don't know. He was like he was a teenager anyway. Um, so, yeah, getting to talk with him briefly and getting to speak with John a little bit longer was was really cool. And his publicist was really sweet. Like uh, she was awesome. Uh, very friendly, very professional, very kind. And uh, yeah, it was great. So. We'll see if I ever hear back from them because I really want to get him a large one of these. So it's something that's a little bit more substantial than a paperweight. But uh, <laughs> um, yeah, we'll see. Because a six, a one six scale one will probably be about a foot and a half to two feet tall, considering the arm's length and everything. But um, but yeah, I don't know. We'll see if uh, we'll see if I ever hear from his uh, publicist or not. But um, or him. But anyway, um, it was cool. So anyway, that's kind of the. Uh, the basics, the basis of this whole thing, the story, the uh, inception of how this all came to um, be. But anyway, sorry, I've been ignoring chat. I just wanted to at least get that all out at the front. And uh, let me see what you guys are are asking. Um, uh, a nice creature. Um, when you prepare models for 3D printing, you need to reduce the polygons or doesn't it matter? I mean, to a degree, yeah. I mean, you don't want to be sending like millions and millions of polygon. Like, you don't want to send millions of pieces of uh, like. Um, so, for instance, um, like a million is fine. I think I might have glued some of this together, so I probably can't take the big one apart. Um, so, like, if you have a piece that's like a million, that's okay. Um, but like, I'm trying to remember what what all these pieces are, and we can actually look in here. But, um, you know, like there's different parts that I would keep as one just for speed or for ease, you know, or different angles. Like you don't want things to be in too many parts if you can avoid it. Um, but again, as you get a larger, as you scale something up, the more pieces it has to be in considering that your build volume is limited. So if your build volume is in like in the Form 3's case, so that's the, for those asking what printer I used, Excuse me. Uh, I use the Form 3 by Form Labs. It's a beautiful uh, SLA slash LFS. So what that stands for is SLA is stereolithography. It's the kind of the original um, old school way of 3D printing that then got revitalized and changed into it became FDM, which is like the glorified hot glue gun kind, which is not what I'm using for these. So SLA stereolithography uses a laser. For those who don't know, you have a clear tank. So the bottom of this tank is clear. It's a very shallow tank which has a cartridge in the printer behind it, which dispenses liquid resin into this tank. Below the tank is you have a uh, what they call the um, laser containment unit. I forget what the exact light emitting container unit. It's this big like 
giant metal cartridge that holds um, a galvanometer, which is a mirror that bounces lasers off of it. So you have a laser in there, a high-powered four or five nanometer nanometer wavelength laser. So it's like an ultra on the verge of ultraviolet light that bounces off the galvanometer, the laser, um, they actually have a parabolic, excuse me, they have a parabolic mirror in there now so that the laser goes up straight. And then it's also um, bounced off of, I think it's off a of galvanometer and then it hits the, the um, parabolic mirror so that it's a more straight vertical up and down laser instead of having these extreme angles. So then you can use more of the entire build volume at the extreme corners and it'll have accuracy as if you were shooting straight up to that area rather than having these leaning lasers where then you kind of get fall off and you get some some room for more error that way so this redesign from the form 2 to the form 3 is, is genius it's brilliant um so yeah the parabolic mirror correct because that was the, the galvanometer only was in the uh, form 2 but anyway um so the laser that wavelength of light you know with a laser you can get incredibly fine detail and that cures the resin instantly so when that light hits the resin it stays on whatever point of resin that needs to be solidified for a few, few, not even a second really like you know milliseconds for as long as or seconds depending on how thick and how wide and you know the need of the resin each resin is different too like this is uh, great pro which has a lot of strength but a little bit of flexibility as well so it can it can take a bit of a beating um, kind of similar to like ABS. ABS plastic is used for Legos, for anyone who's had Legos, which most of us have. Um, so it's a pretty strong, pretty strong, pretty resilient plastic. It can take a bit of a bit of a beating and take some flexion before it'll snap. Um, and there's an even better version of that now, which I'll be printing with other other pieces with, um, which is called Tough 2000. And that refers to, I think, the tensile strength, basically. They have like Tough 2000, they have Tough 1500, and then below that, kind of like tiers of strength and rigidity. Then below that, you have um, Gray Pro, and then maybe above um, Tough 2000, you get much more rigid, but it also becomes more brittle. You have less flexion in it, and that's um, rigid 10K. Uh, so anyway, um, so yeah, so the printer I used was the Form 3 SLA. LFS stands for um, Low Force... LFS, Low Force stereolithography if i'm not mistaken um so it's lower force because in the old school the older previous uh, 3d printer by form labs form 2 the bill plate would come down and you would have the laser print you know solidify the resin and then it would need to pull off you know there would be a uh, peeling effect pull off of the uh the tank essentially and that was also uh a, a more aggressive um printing process where it could easily um, cause issues for some, some you know, like something that might become a little too fused to the base of the tank and that could cause ripping and tearing or breakage. Um, and so the lower force, which is in the new one, right, the Form 3, you, you have almost a natural peeling process rather than having this pulling up to have to like peel off kind of, it pulls at a slight angle, I think. There's a slight angle to everything, so that's a sort of diagonal pull in the original and the two. But in three, form three, you have a, um, a, a inverted natural peeling effect because the light processing unit, the LPU, that has a laser and everything, it it wipes across the bottom of a flexible clear bottom tank instead of a hard rigid glass or plastic tank base, which was the original form two's um, design and the Form 1 as well. So with the Form 3, the light processing unit moves across the bottom, sort of gently scraping or pressing up against the film layer, that's the transparent bottom layer that's flexible. And as it presses against it, it's pressuring it inward slightly as it's printing, and then as it washes past, that area then relaxes again. So that's almost like a natural sort of peeling process against the inside, the you know build platform that's taking the layers that have been printed and pressing that against the base of the um, clear tank so sorry that's a I, probably that's a lot to like just verbalize and not be able to see so much of it but um anyway if you go to formlabs.com and look at their you know they'll have videos that are very clear that show you the insides of how things kind of work very simplistically um but anyway that's that's the process that happens and that's the printer that i used so it's pretty much the most advanced 3d printer that you, the consumers prosumers can own at home without going into the quarter of million dollar range you know once you hit quarter million dollars and up, you know, 250 grand, you can get some incredible, you know, uh, 3D printers that can even do full color um, by Stratasys. The J750 is one a famous one. Um, incredible printers. But yeah, I mean, that's a quarter million dollars. It's kind of out of my budget right now. <laughs> um, 
but they're the size of this desk. They're about the size of like a, an old style or I guess current style still copier machine. You know, think of a, a, like a re refrigerator on its side. Like that's basically the size that they are, even though the build volume for them is probably, probably like a good 30 inches by, I want to say maybe a foot um, by 20 some inches, you know? So it's still like, you're looking at like a, maybe like a 35 inch TV, flat panel TV, but then give it some depth. That's kind of the volume that you have to print on those. But they're great in that they use a water soluble support system. Unlike these where you have to have like these, what they look like stilts, you know, or like sticks that kind of grow to meet areas that have to then have shape. So those supports are what suspend your, your prints as they're, you know, being held upside down, whether you're doing it vertically or, you know, in this case, how SLA works is inverted. Um, no matter what kind of 3D printer you have, there's always going to have to be supports for any overhangs that go past like 85 degrees, 89 degrees. Like once you're going to 90, you can't print, you know, straight out into nothing. You need to have something to meet it unless it's oriented like a tree. So unless you have something growing. So in this case, I could do that for a fair bit of this because like the, um, the base, you know, could be printed pretty much inverted like this because of the, um, the splash, the splash grows out literally like a tree. So in that kind of growth, it's self-supporting because its layers are centered below it before they expand outward at all. So that's always nice when you can print that way because then, or you can model something or orient it that way because then you don't have to have supports and you get a much cleaner print from the get-go instead of having to um, do a lot of cleanup. Also things that help with supports and hiding any sort of little nodules or bits that are left over are any creatures like dinosaurs or like this aliens where they have like a rough skin uh you remove supports and whether there's nodules left or divots left from the removal of the supports and the form 3 is great for supports too like they, they're very they remove very easily by comparison to other ones they, they have an incredibly um right that right middle ground for the um attachment of the uh supports so that they they tear off really cleanly really nicely um but uh with creatures like this that have, you know, an incredible amount of rough texture to the skin, uh, you can often get away with supports leaving any kind of minor imperfections because it will just blend right into the texture of the skin. So something else to always kind of, you know, keep in mind when you're working on a creature that you want to 3D print. Um, so anyhow, so yeah, this was a an incredibly rushed job and uh, I'm happy with the way it came out. I'm happy enough. I mean, it could be better, but... Uh, you know, for having basically about a week of time and working like all night, several nights in a row and <laughs> getting like an hour or two of sleep here and there. Um, you know, I think it came out, came out well enough. So, um, but yeah, I'll probably make some improvements to this if they, uh, if they ever get in touch and would like a one six scale or a, a different pose, you know, I'll definitely be making improvements to it. But, um, but yeah, so this is, this was a quiet place creature alien rush work. And I'll have a little making a video of this put on YouTube, on my YouTube channel. Oops. Um, when I am done with this stream, actually, I'm going to finish that up and put it up online. So anyhow, sorry, that was a long explanation for uh, <laughs> preparing things. Oh, yeah. And so you guys wanted to see one of them. One of you was asking about um, millions of polys or what's the uh, what's account like. So this. All right. So right here we go. So this is what I sent to my uh, form three. So this is about a million polygons. Or just this creature, or this part of the creature, I should say, um, it's for this piece. So if I turn off polyframe, you can see it's just the the pink coloration. So if I unsolo it, you can see how they've been segmented. Um, and I always try to go for a dynamic pose. You know, I mean, it's nice to have neutral poses. Like I, the raptors, I've made a lot of them in neutral, and I have one of them running. Um, neutral is just because that's where you usually start. Is you start with the creature or character in their T pose or neutral state, and then that allows you to get the maximum amount of detail with the in-between range of motion. You know, the most in the middle range of motion that you can get the person or creature in is the best because then you can maximize the amount of detail and um, yeah, just, just details you can put into their joints and everywhere that might be flexing um, usually because if they're gonna be moving their arms in you know multiple directions, you of course want the most in the middle of all those directions as possible. Uh, so that allows you to maximize the amount of detail and then it gives you more coverage, you know, so if you know if they're going to be doing certain things, um, certain actions more than others, in certain ranges of motion, you want to make sure that you're, you know, able to cover that so that it looks 
as realistic as possible without getting any kind of stretching or warping of the textures when those joints are flexing and moving. Um, you know, and again, motion blur helps cover some of that up too. So if there's a lot of motion and movement, you won't really ever have time to ever really focus in on stretching because there's going to be a lot of motion motion there. But uh, still, you always want to get you know as much detail as you can when they're in a neutral state. Um, so anyway, so that was a million, and then I don't see what the arm was. Um, the arm was about a million as well, one million point two. Uh, the other arm, the other arm was five hundred ninety-five thousand, ninety-four thousand. Uh, the base was about two million, and these was this was even after decimation or thing. Oh no, this was actually no, this was just dynameshed. Okay, I forget if I decimated this or not. This may not be this may not be the final, the final final pieces. Um, because there was a couple versions I was saving and, and putting out. This is 3 million. I feel like I decimated some of these. I feel like I did. Um, but still, you could send a 1 million or 2 million poly character or a model to uh, the printer, and it'll still handle it just fine. It may just take a little longer to upload, to load into the software, preform, and then also to um, generate supports for in some cases. Um, but that's, you know, still, it's just waiting a few more minutes. You know, whatever. It's not a big deal. Um but yeah, so anyway, let me get back to uh, chat questions. Um, uh, <laughs> you did fire yourself for cracking pieces. Yeah, right. Uh, hilarious. Um, uh, let's see here. Uh, do I speak Spanish? Not really. I understand more than I speak. Um, but I'm not fluent. Um, the printer is the Form 3. Um, I'm seeing someone asking again what printer was it. Um, um, someone's asking about PayPal payment for ZBrush. I have no idea. I don't... I mean, I work with... Uh, pixel logic for streaming this kind of thing and i'm friends with people over there but i don't have any information concerning how you will you know different payment methods for the software um that's that's not my it's not my department sorry you'll have to message like support at pixel logic you know um you know or, or even just leave them like a message on um on instagram maybe or you know but yeah easiest easiest way to get in touch with guys at pixel logic is just support at pixel .com. Um, they will be able to answer any kind of, you know, any kind of questions you have about the software, whether it's purchasing it or, um, you know, what is uh, a good way, an alternate way of paying. Um, but, uh, but yeah, sorry, I don't really have any other, any other information on that. Um, cause I don't really, you know, I don't work for them. Um, how can I change the color in ZBrush? Um, that's easy. That's in your preferences. Uh, so if you go up to preferences, you come over to, uh, what is it? Uh, eye colors. So preferences, eye colors, and then here you go. You just click on what you want and you want to drag over here, maybe to the colors you'd like to have. So you select the color you'd want something to be, come over here and then click on that and then drag over here. Or I guess in this case, Let's see if you just click on it. I guess it'll take the color that's in your swatch here. Um, if you don't like that, but you have another color somewhere in here that you want it to be like, again, just go back, click, drag, and then let go once you select the other colors. You'll change your colors that way. Uh, and then you just go down the list, you know, just choose the buttons that you want. Um, green color. So yeah, that's how I did the green in my, in my UI setup. Um, Paul Rindon is asking, perfect shape, did, did you make it? Uh, I guess you're referring to the, the alien? Yeah, I mean, I, I like I said, I'll show you. I, I'll see if I can pull up some of the making of video right now. It's still in editing, so it's not it's not at all like one video that I can just play, but I can probably jump around a little bit. Uh, I've been slapping it together quickly in Camtasia, even though normally I would probably do something a little bit more thorough in After Effects and or Premiere. Um, Camtasia is just fast, and it records rather quickly in a smaller file size than... Um, you know, it just works nicer and smoother than uh, trying to um, pull it all together and record it as raw, like AVI files or even MPEG files. But um, it's going to open the project right now, so it'll take a minute. Um, but I can show you just a little bit of, of um, 
the making of this uh, from the time lapse video that I've been compiling, which uh, it's just about done. I, all I need to do is actually just do a turntable of the prints, maybe either before or after I, I prime it. And, uh, and then I'm just going to do some voiceover for this video because I found that I've done a lot of other time lapses in the past and put out videos some music, whatever, and just, you know, end titles and, and opening titles. And that's that's fine, but I feel like it might be a little bit more helpful if I talk through a bit of the time lapse and just some of the little hurdles and challenges and things that happened along the way, just to kind of help people, you know, inform them a little bit more and uh, maybe talk through what you're seeing so it doesn't seem as confusing because it's just a lot of rapid fire, you know, rotation of the model and you see it go from a blob to, or in this case, a human base mesh to like an awkward pose and then you start seeing like a really smoothed out version of this and then you see it go from the incorrect version of the creature so i was said it before i was when i was muted <laughs> i was saying that um i started out with this creature uh referencing uh, a render and a concept model that was done by the original concept artist i believe luis something forgive me for not knowing his last name you can you can find him on art station and uh the creature's design originally looked a little bit more the head was a little bit more human-esque and a little bit longer kind of taller um, and he also did iterations that looked like a chimp, like a chimp skull underneath these plates. And that was pretty cool too. It was pretty freaky. And some of them had eyes that were like whited out, like blinded eyes. Um, but, uh, obviously those were all like concept pieces, but the second to last, seemingly like the second to last design before we got to this, which is in the film, uh, you have, like, if you watch behind the scenes on the Blu-ray of, uh, A Quiet Place, um, you'll see they have a, um, a shot or two of the creature that's just standing there and its arms are extra long and its joints and elbows like humerus to the elbow area was like extra long and kind of curled back and um i was going off of that first thinking though that was the the final model but then i started looking at the film version and looking at this and i'm like ah there's, there's definitely a difference so this was an earlier um pass on the creature before it reached their final like iteration that they used for the film so that kind of I still it still got me like 80% of the way there as I began. I mean, it was on the same path because it's the same general shape and proportions. Uh, but then when I realized that they they switched up the design to develop it further, then I was like, ah, shit. So I got to like shorten the arms and change things around here a little bit. I mean, shorten them from being incredibly long to being a little less incredibly long. But still, there was definitely like a difference that I picked up on as I started looking, putting two and two together and being like, wait a second, this doesn't match what's in the film. So they definitely show you a bunch of different versions of it um, on the behind the scenes, but you kind of have to pay attention a little bit more to realize like, ah, this one version that looks very similar to the last one is not exactly, they're not the same. There's, there are differences. Um, so my hyper attention to detail eventually paid off for that, but also meant I had to kind of backtrack a little bit. So I felt like I wasted some time, which I was always kicking myself for because if I would have had like an extra, I mean, it wasn't a day worth of time, but if I would have had an extra day or two, I would have been able to print this one tenth scale version boxed it up, maybe segmented it once more just so to keep it in a flatter box and I could have given him a bigger version, but oh well, uh, we'll see. Hopefully they get back in touch. But uh, here is the, uh, here is a quick making of video that I'm working on. Let's see if they'll let me scrub through. Um, so like, yeah, we started out with like a human, you know, human base mesh and I just sort of like, there's the, um, that's this is the original concept piece that I was referencing initially. And so you can see like there's differences here where it's more oblong vertically. There's a lot more of the upper gums kind of exposed. Um, and then the uh, the forearms are about the same, but the humerus, the upper arms, that area, when you would look at this in 3D, it's actually, they're extended out a bit further, it seems, and, and at a different angle than um, what the final version was um, kind of positioned at. But it's very close. It's very similar. Other little things like the curvature to the um, the rear claws, these are pretty curved, and the the final version had them a bit more straight. Um, the hands are pretty close to final. I think they just pulled up the um, in between the fingers. I think they kind of lengthened that a bit more. Um, hey, it's okay. Shh. Sorry, it's my my corgi. Ein. It's okay. No, no, no barking. No, go lay down. Sorry. Anyway. Um, I think you heard my friend come in. Uh, anyway, so little anatomy differences that you know wind up having a, a greater effect when you're when you're all finalized. But so this is just kind of going through some of that process um, where I'm matching it up, and you know again doing little things like guessing focal length. You know, assuming like ah oh, this is either a hundred millimeter lens or let's try a thirty five millimeter. Lens. I think I stuck with about hundred millimeter because that's a good that's a good sized lens that is often used. You know, and sometimes a little bit more depending on distance in the room and the feel, but 
usually 100 millimeters, you know, between 50 to 100 is where people like to keep a lot of um, humanoid looking, whether it's a person or something like a human, because that's close to where our eyes kind of see, you know, usually it's like 50, they call it nifty 50. It's like a general happy zone. Excuse me. Um, I know some people argue for like 35 being similar, but that's also like, that's more of like what we, I think what we can see like at a full circumference, you know, within a periphery, while 50 is more of like that zone where you're usually talking with somebody, you're in that kind of area of a 50 millimeter lens. 85 is you're a little bit more of a distance, 100 is obviously more, and you, you start getting the, the face gets compressed more, and it looks, to a certain point, there starts to be this increasingly better proportioned, nice, more attractive looking uh, appeal to the face when you start lengthening the lens to a certain point and then it starts to become too compressed where it's almost orthographic where you just have like a flat like as if there's almost no perspective so it doesn't have the roundness to it it kind of looks like it's almost 2d and like just flattened like pancaked and that's that that's where the face starts to look weird um so if you're focusing on somebody with like a 250 millimeter lens their face is going to look pretty compressed um versus 85 is a nice area still i think like 85 is nice um, but I think I went for 100, I think, for this, for the most part. And that's what I stuck with when I was modeling this. And it seemed to work pretty well, you know, because as I would match everything up from different, all kinds of different shots, things seemed to really work really well. So I think 100 millimeters was a pretty good middle ground, you know, or pretty close to whatever whatever was the most common length of lens that they used for both concepting and and in, in, uh, in camera compositing, you know, final final work for everything in the end that was um, renders uh, that were renders that were you know, used for the um, composites for the final shots so yeah this is kind of just goes through the whole really rapid fire like I think there's a lot of chunks of, of work that was like right in this section <laughs> that I, I didn't record because um, I either forgot to hit record or um, yeah, basically that I think because I was just going so back and forth so much and then pausing it to go get some food and come back and eat while I was working and you know just um and it's not like this is, I mean, I was definitely like killing myself kind of to get this done in time, but it's not like that's uncommon for a lot of work when you have a short deadline and you need a lot of work to be done in that amount of time. It's unfortunately, but it comes with the gig. It comes with a lot of visual effects. It's just, you got to, you got to get it done. Like, so it's like whatever it takes, <laughs> period. So, you know, if you got to pull a couple of all-nighters, you just do it. And then usually at the end of it, you have a nice paycheck, of course. But in this case, it was just at least being able to have something of finished piece that I could physically offer. Um, so and that was the reward, I guess you could say. Um, not that I was doing it all for even attention or money or nothing, none of that. Um, it's a nice way of to saying like, hey, I'd love for you to remember me in case you're working on another film that I could contribute to. Like, I would genuinely love to work with John. I, I told him that um, because it's true. Like, there's a lot of directors that I've had to work with because I'm at a studio and they come on and we're working on their movie and it's just, it's a job. And it's like you happen to be working with them or for them or underneath somebody that's working with them or for them. And it's fine. Nope, I'm not complaining at all. It's always great whenever you get to work on a, a cool movie or a cool commercial or whatever. Um, but that's just people that are basically forced upon you. It's just comes with a job. It's another thing when you admire someone's work and you want to work with this person and you're like that loyalty and that commitment is far more. You can't purchase that really. You can't buy someone's affection for your work and for the you know the work that you're putting out there and that's where i was coming from obviously um so that was the whole point of this was simply just to kind of like an advanced business card <laughs> i guess you could say beyond just the card of saying like hey i like your work and i'd love to work with you and here's little samples this was a bit more than that of course but um not something i do on the regular unless it's it's a you know i've probably only done this really once before um for the last guardian and it's because it's a a pitch piece that I'm working on as a short film as a cold pitch to Sony really um but also because I became friends with the composer from the game and I met the creator of the game as well and I'm friends with the sound designer and so I want to give them all as a thank you because I just the game was so the story is so moving and is so tremendously well done and beautiful and you know it's a boy and his dog except the dog is this giant griffin creature um that was my way of just being like just honestly just thank you and I love the work you did it touched me so much here's a piece of art that's just a piece of gratitude, you know, again, not expecting anything from it really at all. Um, other than showing just how much I love their, their work and put in like hundreds of hours into making Trico. So the uh, big Griffin creatures, so if you go on my site, go to linearts.com, line-arts.com, you'll see this scroll a couple images past the quiet place creature and you'll see 
it was really elegant. I didn't design it. I just replicated it, of course. Um, that, you know, Sony owns the rights to it and all that. Um, but Fumito Ueda, great Japanese, famous Japanese designer, game designer. He made Shadow of the Colossus. Everybody knows Shadow of the Colossus. Before that, Ico. And then, of course, The Last Guardian most recently. And um, that game is just incredible. Just an incredible story. Really moving, really beautiful, very mature, um, very powerful. You know, and it's, it's very moving as you follow the story of this young boy who's wakes up with this creature in the middle of this ruined city and then he has to befriend the creature and realizes it's not his enemy and in turn they actually become each other's saviors and it's just this really beautiful touching epic huge i mean it's just the beautiful from a seed into this massive tree of a story and just it really just blows up and it's just gorgeous An incredible soundtrack um i love um takeshi furukara's work furukara san's composition for that whole game is just phenomenal you know it has trinity boys choir um london air uh, you know they, they recorded that um london air studios um they had london voices i believe was the other adult mostly female choir if i'm not mistaken um and the london symphony orchestra like come on like <laughs> um or the london is it london, london symphony or london philharmonic orchestra actually i forget now i think it's philharmonic or no London, London, I forget. Anyway, one of the two, sorry, brain fart right now. But it's um, an incredible, an incredible soundtrack too. Like the music is just, it's like, that's, that's what I love. And that's, that's what all of this comes down to is, uh, mm -hmm. is I love the films, the games, the stories that the visual media where you get, you get it all, which is rare, right? But that's like a lot of a Spielberg's work because you have, you know, him directing, you have some great writers like Crichton or um, David Kep when they did Jurassic Park. And then you have this incredible composer that's just like mind blowing, like the Mozart of our generation, John Williams, um, creating theme after theme after theme for different characters and different films and, and just all these incredibly emotionally engaging, touching, brilliant melodies that will stay with us forever. You know, people can hum and you'll just, you'll hear a few notes and you know immediately what that theme is, right? What movie that's connected to, what emotion you had, what, which family members or friends you were with when you saw the film, right? For the first time, all those things just, they all coalesce and they come from a moment when a bunch of different people got together from around one person's great idea and work to glorify it, to exemplify it. Right. And they came together to say, look, we all, we all either want or are glad to be a part of this project, and then we're going to work as hard as we can to to make it a masterpiece. And that usually comes from a great story that has someone who's at the helm, a director, hopefully, that gets it and can glorify and exemplify it and bring together all these desperate pieces where you have great actors, great script, of course, great actors, great cinematography, excellent music, great editing. And then, of course, on top of it, the candy, the cherry on top, the sugar is the special effects, right? The visual effects. That's all in service to a great story, though, right? You have, you have every all those other elements, but you don't have a great story or a good director. Both of those are important, but if you just don't even have a good story, it's like, ugh, then it's like, who cares, right? Sadly, um, there's so much great artwork that goes into like really talented, really gifted artists are working on films that get poo pooed because someone was an idiot who okayed a bad script. Sadly, uh, and that happens all too often, um, you know, or even just a mediocre script, you know. Um, and this here are some cool red renders that I did, um, just cause red's the motif of the films. So anyway, um, so the video is pretty much almost done. I just need to, like I said, do a turntable, a real turntable, I'll crossfade from this into a real turntable of the real 3d print. Um, and just kind of do a little layer of voiceover of this whole thing. And then this will be up and online. So almost there. Um, so anyhow, so that puts us at exactly 305. So from here to the end, I'm going to try and do Neo, <laughs> train, uh, change gears here and get back to uh, Keanu Reeves likeness that I've been slowly working my way across. Um, but sorry, I've been neglecting chat again as I've just sort of been talking and finishing this up. So let me just take a quick look and see what else you guys have been saying. Um, uh, so someone's asking, Comics Legends asking, uh, how do you take into account the weight distribution when 3D printing? Um, it's just from experience, uh, mostly. And I was really like, it was at first I was really nervous about this because I knew the pose that I wanted, but it was all about pushing certain joints to extremes, um, from what I felt were extremes. And now I'm thinking like they're probably still a bit more flexion to the joints allowed within their, you know, uh, within their world than I, I had initially realized. 
Um, but yeah, just for those who are wondering again, like here's the, you know, for anyone joining later, it's I always like pushing the 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 visual you know effect of something no pun intended, but I mean just just you want energy you want life you want motion you know that's what I want I want people to look at something and have it look appealing if not awesome from as many angles as possible, um, and with something like this a dynamic creature that's that's so you know, grotesque and cool and it's that right mixture right you want your villains to have a certain amount of attraction like a certain level of appeal. And not be so revolting but that you just don't want to look at them either you know you want that right balance where the creature is interesting and scary and intimidating yet has a certain kind of awesome appeal to it too like an awesome power that's that's you respect you know that you want that's the ideal creature and this hits a lot of those notes i gotta say like my only critique of the creature design would have been maybe less human head maybe a bit more mantis head or insectoid or just not so humanoid. That's the only critique I would give it, but still a really appealing creature. And then when the plates pull off, it looks very much not human. Um, unfortunately, it can be, it, I think there there can be a, um, I mean, it's uh, of your opinion, it could be unfortunate or it could be fortunate. It has a slight resemblance in silhouette when all the plates are removed To I'm sure you already put this together. Uh, Stranger Things, Demagog Demogorgon, kind of has a similar flowery sort of look to it. Um, but I think this creature's design is far superior to the Demogorgon in that it's... The less human something is, to me, the more the more disturbing it can be. Um, and I'm just more of an animal person. Like, I like animals and designs of creatures and animals more than just doing people. Unless there's a human character that I'm a big fan of, which is not that many. <laughs> I'm not a big superhero person. Like I'm not, I, I've said this in other streams. I just don't really care for superheroes that much. But I loved Iron Man, you know, whatever. Superman, Man of Steel, I actually really enjoyed a lot. Um, so there's certain things, you know, Batman's, of course, fun. Like, those are probably the big three that I've enjoyed. Whether they were my my sister was into comics oddly enough when she was younger a bit into the like Batman and the animated series we loved that as kids um, so those you know there's some really solid great superheroes or hero like characters out there that I've enjoyed and Spider Man's fun whatever but um, you know Spider Man Two is a great movie for sure um, but in general uh, I just I love dinosaurs I love animals I love dogs you know I love nature and uh, and science and novel novel things novel ideas novel visuals um i love the films that i love because of the great stories but also like i said they have all all pistons going you know all all cylinders firing and um so like jurassic park the matrix interstellar indiana jones last crusade back to the future um aliens terminator 2 um those are some of my anyway, those are my favorites but there's so many others i mean i love the mission impossible movies that's all human centric no animals no creatures um, but, uh, I love great adventures, but if I had to pick those favorites, those top three are, you know, um, I guess two of them are very human centric, obviously, but, um, the matrix even has a cool creature design. You could say with the sentinels being very like octopi, very octopus like, um, squiddies, right. They call them. And then, um, just the, the look and stylization of the matrix is so unique and so much fun. Um, but yeah, Jurassic Park, of course, because when I was a kid, I, I already was worshiping. I was at the altar of Phil Tippett without knowing it because he did this great um, animations, stop motion animations for. Um, so it was all puppets, you know, that they pose, take a picture, pose, take a picture, and then do that millions of times. Of uh, this um, CBS special on dinosaurs that was hosted by Christopher Reeve, the late Christopher Reeve, who was our my generation's original Superman, and uh, and that was a um, staple of my childhood. Was was borrowing that. VHS cassette tape from the local library in, in Lancaster, uh, Pennsylvania, and um, taking that home and just p playing that thing to death because <laughs> there was just all these incredible, like, interjected in between Reeves talking about dinomania in America and in the world. There would be these incredible short little featurettes of these vignettes of these dinosaurs that looked pretty much photoreal because they were physical models that were probably like, you know, about this big or so, like a foot. So, um, that were being animated that were all done by Phil Tippett and his wife and like a few other friends. Um, they did it in his garage, you know, it was incredible. And he won the, he was awarded, you could say the, um, job of being dino supervisor and slash lead animator, um, for the original Jurassic Park because of his work on that show. And that show was given to him because he did a short on his own volition, I guess, um, that was called Prehistoric Beast, which was all about this monoclonius, like a horn dinosaur, just with one big horn, monoclonius, you know, one horn. 
and uh, a T-Rex that kind of comes after it and hunts it down as it's separated from the pack that is outside the forest. Very creepy, very cool um, short. So you can find these all on YouTube. Uh, but there's like incredible like photorealistic sculptures, incredible just lighting and atmosphere and music and sound design, all from the mind of just one guy, you know. And that it's just one thing led to the other that led to the Jurassic Park and then now, you know, Tippett Studio after that. So, and I've met Phil a bunch of times. He's an awesome guy. He's and a friend, I guess you could say. I, I say that loosely only because I don't want to like overstep bounds, but you know, we have each other's numbers. Like, you know, whenever I'm in town, he's always welcoming me to come by the studio and say hi. And I, it's just, it's one of those rare opportunities where they say, don't meet your heroes, but I've met like almost all my heroes that are alive and they've all been awesome. They've all been really great, intelligent, kind, gracious people. So I've been really lucky, I guess, to um, admire some, some really kind, gracious, intelligent people. <laughs> um, but uh, anyway, um, yeah, so anyway, so Jurassic Park, that's that's why it just became like my my holy grail as a kid it was because I was already obsessed with dinosaurs and unknowingly obsessed with the right people that wound up becoming the kind of people who, um, you know, who uh, created uh, the films and, and things that I, I loved as a kid. So anyway, um, so what have you guys been saying? Um, do you hollow out portions of the model? Yeah, I do. Like I hollowed out the, uh, the central piece of the... Uh, the humanoid part of the the whole human from head to tail of the uh, alien so like this whole section is um i guess i can't I forget i think i glued this thing together and i don't remember because i was just rushing to get this done too but i think you can see <laughs> probably looks kind of wet still down here but this is the uh let me blow this up again for you this is going to be kind of gross but um you know whatever uh shit, let me grab the right one here okay so if you look at the butt <laughs> <laughs> you're gonna see a hole <laughs> and uh there's that hole i think you can see it right right there in between the legs so that's a drainage hole and uh if you look in the mouth you can see <laughs> he has a gi tract basically um if you look inside the mouth you can kind of see a hole in there as well it's pretty hard because of shadows but there is a hole in the mouth basically in the throat right right where that would be so that whole intersection of this let me see if i can get the angles right here this whole midsection is hollow um, and I believe into the arms as well, it's hollow. But then this is a separate piece that's solid because it was just, it's so thin and small. I left it solid. Um, inside these legs, I believe it's slightly hollow as well. Uh, and then like down here, it's just all solid, just one giant chunk of uh, of resin because it's, you know, it's, it's the base. So it's meant to hold it. So yeah, someone, a comics legend asked about weight distribution. Um, so it's just, it just comes from familiarity, from just being familiar with the materials and how they distribute, and then also just simple knowledge of anatomy, basically thinking, well, you know, if you have this much weight on this end, and you have this much weight on that end, obviously, if you can divide it in half and try to have a, a center of gravity, where it's mostly hovering over that center of gravity overall. Um, so as you can see, there's sort of a symmetry or balance here to weight, like the arm if you just think of this as a two-dimensional object and you see the top arm and the bottom arm and how they angle out from the center, it's pretty balanced. Um, you know, the one leg is sort of straight up and down, its right leg, and then its left leg is out to the side kind of. So again, simulating like a gallop where one leg is gonna be out in front of the other slightly. Um, so I was really thinking of just how they would move from a quadrupedal gallop into like launching into a, a running an attack. Um, so just again, just thinking of basic movement and anatomy, you know, it's sort of like an in-between an animal and a human, kind of like a gorilla, you know, the way a gorilla would move. Um, and so then the upper arm, it's so thin and light that, you know, it wasn't much concern though either. So the main chunk of the weight is, is obviously would be in the, the mass of this creature, which is the center. And then of course the base is just solid, solid resin, just a huge chunk. So you're going to obviously have a lot of a lot of weight holding the rest of the very spindly light element down so that's where i felt pretty safe with what i was doing i was a little nervous but that's also why i made the base that kind of you know one thing led to another where i was thinking of weight distribution and how to uh, what to create for the base and i always like putting in titles and names of the people involved or whatever if i have the opportunity and since no one was art directing me on this except myself um i decided well you know i you'll see in the making a video very briefly that i used um the ground is actually all like mud and, and dirt and uh, sticks and twigs and all this kind of stuff. 
um, figured it worked great as a natural outdoor, you know, piece of environment that I took from Megascans. So Quixel's Megascans, which are free assets that if you have an Unreal account, you can access all of them. I'd already downloaded a lot of them because I'm working on my short film in Unreal and I need a lot of natural assets because The Last Guardian has a lot of nature overgrowing beautiful ruins. And so you need a lot of natural elements. And so these are all photo scans. So they're all real photogrammetry elements that are taken from real world nature and then created a point cloud and then they're solidified in the polygons and then they're textured. So I just took one of those um, natural assets, which is like a dirt forest ground. And uh, it's all, it was open face too. So it's just like a plane that had all these textures on it. So I inserted that into the um, kind of like, I guess, what pentagonal shape that I created for the base. And, and then sort of pushed it down and sort of, this was all happening really fast too, because I hadn't preconceived this. I was sort of like flying by the seat of my pants, trying to figure out how to make a base that made sense. That was just at least around this size. So it would weigh down the awkward stance of the creature and also could allow for like a puddle of water because there is a lot of water. That's another element that we see commonly in uh, these two movies is these creatures interacting with water one way or the other. So um, I decided why not make a puddle of, so I've had this idea in the past for like a raptor that I made that I've never really finished the base for, but it's the same concept that the foot is splashing through a little stream, a little river stream. In this case, in this case, it's a puddle, but the the hand coming down on there allows for a great excuse to keep a splash that will allow it to grow, be 3D printed like a tree, right? So you print it upside down so that this comes out like that. And then the hand comes out of that. And so then I chopped off the hand at the logical breakpoint, which would be the wrist in this case, because it has really long metacarpals. So you chop it off at the wrist and then add those pegs inside. So I can solo out this so you guys can see what I'm talking about um, to the base. So this is where, um, and even this angle I was a little nervous about, but I figured, all right, this is about a 45 degree angle um, from almost both directions, I guess you could say. Um, so, you know, it's at an angle that's that's pretty... It's pretty safe. It's pretty much reaching that that careful limit, you know. Um, and then, so this is all. This was all for mega scans. All this debris that you see down here. But I figured I just used the flat surface that is the the base pentagonal shape that I designed, and then brought it out here, and then just pressed it into pressed all the edges because it was like an oval kind of shape, sort of an oblong oval. Pressed all the edges inside the octagonal shape. And then depress certain areas where I wanted there to be water so that the surface would all be kind of leveled where the water would be residing amongst this debris. Um, so I pressed down the, the ground earth, you know, mesh and whatever. Uh, and then I what I did was live boolean. So I did that. So you turn on live boolean and when you have two separate meshes that are intersecting each other, wherever they're intersecting, they will be welded. You know, those points of polygons will be welded together. So that's where allowed this to become a water type mesh rather quickly. Um, but because it's so jumbled and, and, and garbled, you know, like all these little pieces, there was definitely a point where the bullying was creating some problems. It was finding like certain points where all certain polygons were sharing too many vertices, like sharing points together. So I had to clean it up a bit, do a dynamesh, like a high, high, like that's why it's like one part, three million pieces, three million polys, the other one's like two, because I had to like dynamesh pieces together uh, in order to um, clean it up, essentially, to delete polygons that were intersecting each other or that were sharing the same points that shouldn't be. Um, so little errors like that that were really frustrating because I knew it was just simple certain areas that were just the problems, not the whole thing, just one or two little points that were causing the issues. But eventually it was like, just dynamesh it. It'll clean everything up and do it really high res. Um, so that worked out. And then, yeah, again, live Boolean with text. So you can go over here to Z plugin, go to uh, your 3D text tool. And then I quickly did an assessment of like the, the biggest, most common uh, fonts that uh, looked similar, like really, really close to uh, A Quiet Place's font. And I found, I think it was Cabrera, I think, or something like that. That was the closest. And so then it was so close. All I had to do was widen certain letters slightly and just do really minor adjustments. And that's what you saw in the video as I was scrubbing through. There's like, I use the actual title of the film and then just widened, shrunk, or manipulated the, each letter from this font to match exactly what the film's... Um, type font was and here we go and now we got this segment that push it down or extend and extrude their um their depth into the base enough so that it would cut into the uh the uh, forestry ground and uh there we go and then you got your nice little negative space forming the letters a quiet place and then of course same technique but much more simple 
just typing out a John Krasinski film and then inserting it into um, the base in the front so that from the sides, it still has like a very nice clean flush. Everything has a very nice, just flush, clean look. Um, I was thinking of having things pull out, but again, like the way they feel, the way they look, the way they can catch things and break, thinking of all those things and saying, well, let's just make it a negative. So then that it's so much easier to and cleaner, you know, as an appearance and it catches the light very nicely, just an inverted version of when you have something extruded out. But this way it does has less chances of getting caught and snagged on things or whatever and just being flung across the room by someone's sleeve by accident or something. So just kind of like thinking of all those factors, like negatives better in this case. Um, same thing for my uh, little, you know, my contribution, <laughs> my uh, name or my uh, website name, I should say. Um, and unfortunately, man, like, yeah, the, the there's a chip that happened here. So I'm like, I was definitely like a little upset that I, I couldn't have everything be so pitch perfect when I gave it to John. But, uh, you know. Still came out overall great, I think. It's uh, just unfortunate that it wasn't exactly as what would have taken just an extra 10 hours to a print, which was this version. So hoping that I can, like I said, get a hold of them and uh, or their watch out and, uh, you know, be able to get John a more um, finalized version of this. But anyway, so yeah, long, long explanations here. Sorry. Um, sorry, it gets stuck on the mess. So many gifted artists. What will us on gifted artists do? <laughs> um, how can you sleep with that in the same room? Hilarious. So dynamic. Thank you. I tried. I try to make something again. Like I try to go for dynamism. I try to go for motion and, and lines of action. You know, excitement. I always want that energy to be there. Um, amazing art, Daniel. Really, really cool. Thank you. Um, did I use any supports for the printing? Yeah, definitely. Um, there was a bunch of different supports. Mostly, like, the creature was on its back. Um, that's how that printed. And then the arms were just at different angles. I kept them rather low, so, like, past 45 degrees, so that all the arms needed supports from some angle. Um, but, like, the hand was, like, printed up this way, you know, with the claw fingers going away, so that they didn't have supports on the tips. Um, but I, I kept them lower angle because, again, the less amount of layers it has to go through, the faster it's going to print. And I also put it to the lowest printer settings, so... Especially with creatures that are all gnarled and, and detailed like this line layer lines, they barely you barely see them anyway on a form three because it's just such high beautiful resolution with the laser. But even at its lowest setting on Gray Pro, um, you won't really see layer lines much because it's just all the details already in there. Um, I think you kind of slightly see some in the water ripples because I printed those flat, so there's layers going through the water ripples like that. But again, they're so concentric and perfect that they kind of just work with with the uh, with the print when I printed it flat against the um, build platform. Um, so anyhow, um, I think I got through all the main questions on the chat. Uh, so yeah, so that's a quiet place creature, <laughs> alien. Um, let me get over to let me load the um, project of Neo, Mr. Reeves, and we can go from there. Okay, so anyhow, that's story time. Sorry for the long explanations, but hopefully everyone found that somewhat interesting. Uh, let me, <laughs> we just lost a bunch of people now. I guess they're like, ah, I'm done. Don't care for Keanu, just want the alien. Uh, let me just pull my chair in here again. Okay, so. All right. Uh, thanks, Hanny. Appreciate it. Um, all right, let's see if I can click out of here. All right, there we go. Ibera Sculpts asking, gonna watch the fight? Um, I'm not sure which fight you're talking about. I'm not really, I mean, I'm assuming maybe like a UFC fight or something. I'm not really, I don't really follow UFC fights. I mean, if there's always like a cool knockout or something, I'll, I'll check it out like after the fact, but I never really have actively been like, let's go watch a fight. Like, meh, it's never been my thing. But I mean, I've had friends to watch it with. <laughs> if I had like dudes who were really into it, I'm sure I'd watch it with them. But uh, I don't really have a lot of friends who are, who are into UFC. Um... Not locally, anyway, I should say. It's friends back in Pennsylvania that are into it. But, um, yeah. Uh, okay, so yeah, not too many questions. Um, cool, all right. So
So, uh, getting back to this, this has been uh, this has been taking me, I guess, forever. But um, so it was a bit of a compromise with this guy too, because I want the expression to be pretty close to this, but not exactly. So then, in turn, though, it's like kind of guessing how would you know Keanu's nose fall slightly if he's not sneering exactly like this, or the flare of the nostrils isn't quite there. Um, you know, and then it's looking up other looking up other things like, man, my hard drives are almost full. I gotta. I gotta empty out some stuff here. I gotta get more hard drives. <laughs> uh, but let me let me look up the. Uh, there's one photo that's from behind the scenes of the shot that looks great. Um, where is it? Here it is. This shot. Pretty good. But again, as I've said in previous streams, the uh, facial expressions can get funny whenever we're doing something with a lot of concentration or effort. All of us make. Uh, in uh, you know unintentional involuntary facial expressions that uh look kind of funny so like, this is so extreme the the uh the frown that uh i didn't want to go for quite like that and this is a bit more focused and cool but i still feel like it mine is a little weaker still i still need to tweak some points to make it look a little bit more intense um but the pose here is awesome I think the pose is is great uh, except for again, the leg will actually be making contact with the uh, the guards, the SWAT guys' face, so that'll create a point of connection. So it'll be a very kind of it'll look tenuous, you know, as far as like the balancing act of everything. But it's going to be a lot like the the Quiet Place sculpt print in the end, where the leg will be connected to the guy's face, and then that obviously connects to the rest of his body. His two feet are planted on the ground, so that creates a frame to another bigger a frame. So then his leg goes from the face obviously to his body, and then his other leg is in the air, his arms are in the air, but his, I always want to say cape, his <laughs> coat, is, uh, his trench coat is flowing into the pillar that's right back here. It'll be touching the pillar, so a slight artistic license to um, just to create it to be possible, because otherwise I don't think this could all hang, even if it was really hollow, it would be too much weight jiggling and easily would break somewhere on the neck, probably the guy's head, the SWAT team's head. Um, that's probably where the, the point that would snap because um, of all the weight of, of Neo's, you know, of that character on that one point is too much. So I'm going to pull the coat so that it creates a nice A-frame structure so that there's enough weight distribution um, being spread across the whole print so that it doesn't just snap, you know. And even then I'll have to, like, cheat to kind of thicken the coat a bit so that it's not too thin so it doesn't just break like paper either. Um, so definitely going to be a few challenges in there. Um, but right now I guess the challenge here is... Uh, He's getting the face exactly right. Um, I brought in some eyebrows from. <laughs> they look extra wrong right now because they're not they're not properly um, positioned. But uh, let's see here. Um, but I brought these in from his um, cyberpunk model. Um, oh, duh, that's why it's the wrong one. Um, so I used this was his scan, his original scan. For those who may not have seen this before. Um, I got a you know, a scan, quote unquote, from from the game Cyberpunk, where they actually scanned Keanu's face, and someone ripped the model from the PC version, and so this is as accurate a, a face of Keanu that you could have, unless you had access to an actual, the final high res scan that um, CD Projekt Red did of his head. So obviously, proportions, volume is all there because it's his real face. Um, I'm assuming that little things are different from this scan to when he was here because there's a good 20 some year gap between literally i guess 20 yeah 20 ish 21 year gap because i'm not sure exactly when they scanned it i only scanned it probably like four years ago maybe or three years ago so it might have been a little less but still close to 20 years age difference from one's face in the matrix which was actually filmed i guess during like 1997 or 98 so this was actually somewhere like 98 and this scan was probably more like I don't know, 2018, 2019, maybe, maybe even earlier, maybe 2016 or 2017, because I know they were working on this game for forever, and I'm not exactly sure when they contacted him and implemented him, because I know there's a lot of, like, there was a lot of back and forth. Um, but anyway, point is, there's a good two decades-ish between this footage and this scan. So there's going to be changes in the body, of course. Your notes is going to be slightly bigger, ears will be slightly bigger, um... Those are the big differences and any kind of weight gain, of course, because he was in really great shape for the Matrix. And I'm sure that it's been challenging to keep some of that uh, exact weight, you know, fat ratio on anyone's face because the face changes so quickly, so easily, usually with any kind of weight gain or loss. 
um, as well as if there was any kind of injuries at all or any kind of like, you know, extra muscles being pulled or stretched in a certain moment that can uh, cause the face to have a very different look because we're so, our muscles and our face and the weight distribution is so dynamic um, that you can get a lot of different looks from the same person's face between just a few years. So, you know, this is a good basis, but that's again where I did the basis for it, Z wrapped it, and now we're here. Excuse me. So, you know, I match this pretty closely, um, but I still think, as you can see them intersecting, but I still think that there's there's a bit more work that I need to do here where maybe like pulling in the cheeks a little bit more because it looks a little fuller on my model currently than uh, than it matches up here. But these are all, these are <laughs> hair cards. So these are like just flat polygons that hold a texture that is transparent. So all you see is just the hair and then the black or the other colors are negative or gone. Um, but I'm just using them here as reference, but I still need to position them properly. And then I'll sculpt in, you know, fine detail of the, the brows into, into this actual um, model since you don't obviously want to have hair follicles extending out and something that's going to be 3D printed because it would never print. Um, but yeah, so for instance, these are obviously too high and, uh, but it just helps to be like to flesh out like what would this look like with sculpted eyebrows. So I'm just sort of just bringing in because they obviously referenced his his real scan and placed these accordingly. So I think if I can at least get close to where it would make sense for these to be on his face, it'll help me more accurately sculpt the uh, the eyebrows for him. So that's why I'm pulling these in here just as just as some reference, just as some helpful, quick and easy reference for where the eyebrows may be and uh yeah how they would look because you can barely uh, you know you can barely see them here as as his, his grimace is so strong and the glasses come up over the eyebrows so they kind of it's like aviators they hide the eyebrows you know so you don't it gives it that it gives anybody that more cool calm expressionless kind of look when you can't see the eyebrows you know you get the tension in the face here obviously from the brow furrowing but the actual eyebrows themselves are concealed, so it still gives somebody like a cold, calculated, little inhuman kind of look, which for a villain or a hero, in this case a badass hero, it, it works really well. It's very effective. Sorry, let me just check one thing quick. Yeah, it looks like uh, it looks like Kyle got the uh, title changed, so hopefully it looks better for everybody, either now or when the video is posted later. Um, glass curvature indicates the eyebrow looks so cool. Yeah, yeah, the glass curvature exactly kind of gives it that, kind of gives it a certain look. Um, yeah, those glasses. I feel like the glasses still are probably. A little off. I feel like they're slightly bigger here than they need to be, but I've done I've done comparisons too, where I've taken that other taken that other shot where he has a nice profile shot um, when he's about to roll out from the second to last or the last pillar he hides behind, and they seem to match up pretty well. Um, but it was hard to because some of these were blurry. Uh, but yeah, this one's decent. I mean, it's blurry still, but it's not that blurry compared to the others. Um, so I don't know, maybe they, maybe they are right, though, you know? We can try and check this again. Solo out just the glasses. And let's see here. Uh, scroll. I guess I'll scroll sideways slightly. Uh, just so I can avoid, you know, having that interfere because I have this just behind the program.
Let's see, position this like so, shrink it down. So this is all this is all reverse engineering. That's all this is is <laughs> reverse engineering slash copying, you know. Um, but that's that's the name of the game a lot of the time, you know. We got to match things up for shots or for props or for likenesses, and it's all about just getting it to match what was filmed or what's real. So it's might seem like cheap because I'm just copying something else, you know, for those who are kind of fresh to this, but that's that's a lot of our jobs. It's replicating something real to match it one to one. Um, so whether it's in this case as a tribute piece or in other cases when it's it's for film, if it's a real corresponding prop, your whole job is just make it look like the real thing so that no one can tell that it's not. You know, that's almost it's kind of a sad, interesting like dichotomy of CG. It's like the best CG is the kind that you can't tell it wasn't real, right? It looks like it was real. Um, and there's only times, and that one of the most successful times is when you your brain thinks, your eyes, your brain thinks what you're looking at is real, but your cognizant, your, your consciousness is saying, I know it's not. I know it's not, but it looks 100% like what I'm seeing is real. That's the one that's the most successful. And I've only seen that really, you know, a handful of times um, where it's really like hard to, to, to tell yourself it's not real. I think I'm so brainwashed by Jurassic Park that so many of the shots, and I, they do hold up, like so everyone agrees, they still look great today. There's some that don't, you know, they don't look perfect, but so many still look so good today because they just concentrated so well on lighting, matching lighting, getting great movement, getting, getting great weight, and, uh, and then also compositing, you know, really well. Um, same thing can be said for um, the apes in especially the last Planet of the Apes movie, the Andy Serkis one, um, Planet of the, War for Planet of the Apes. Um, there's that shot where I forget the name of the uh, orangutan. But the orangutan is looking at this little girl who I think is deaf, if I'm not mistaken, as well. And it's this really beautiful shot with the golden lighting kind of coming in through the bedroom, really warm, like almost an E.T. kind of like intimate, just... Mm, just a warm just loving feeling and it's such a tight shot on the orangutan's face and you see the texture of the skin and the hair coming out and the eyelids and the eyelashes and everything it just sings it just works together and harmoniously and it feels you believe you're looking at something real you don't even question it and it's so hard to like to not believe it because you know it's not real but it looks like they just filmed an orangutan acting that's what it looks like and that's awesome like what a compliment what an achievement um a buddy of mine who uh i can't i can't say anything about it other than that they're they're going to be um they're lucky that they're going to be at weta soon and uh for a while and we we both conferred when we for but we we live we live apart a bit but he's also in california but not not i'm in la he was in san francisco and we were just chatting about what the last movies we saw recently i think i had to call him and just be like dude have you seen have you seen uh war for the planet of the apes and he was like yes and we both almost said simultaneously like best visual effects ever like hands down that was just some of the most incredibly realistic um cg characters we've ever seen and weta was the one to deliver it was awesome so i'm, I'm really proud and excited that he's going to be joining them for a while he deserves it um but uh man um Incredible. So that's again one of the few. And then most recently, I had another, I had another one of those moments, another one of those experiences. And it was oddly, of all places where I didn't expect to see it, but it shouldn't surprise me that much because Blur does incredible work always. Um, they Blur did Blur Studios did this incredible piece of work on uh, the last, the new season of Love, Death, and Robots. And I like season two a hell of a lot more than season one personally. All the work in general all the realistic work in particular it was all always done well done like technically always artistically really well done didn't care for a lot of the messages that were in the first season as they were like pretty pretty clearly like politically motivated to some degree or like agenda driven it was like just tell us a good story like we don't need to be preached at all the time we want entertainment to be entertained not to be not to hear the news again in a different package right so thankfully this this last season um was not it didn't seem like any of them really like politically motivated so much as they were just great fun little 
vignettes, featurettes, like just entertaining, like great little stories. Each was about 18 minutes long. I highly recommend you watch season two of I Love Death and Robots if you haven't seen it. It's great. But there's one, without spoiling anything, there's one that stars, and I guess it's kind of unaccredited. Like I don't see them plastering his name anywhere, but it's clearly Michael B. Jordan. And it looks like the actor just, they just filmed him. Like they just filmed him for most of this. There's definitely shots where you know, like the physics is off, where you can tell like, oh, well, that that injury and those bodily fluids would wouldn't flow that way. They would flow faster or be a little bit more um, less viscous. You know, like little things like as a nerd again, as someone who's super crazily attentive to detail, oops, um, would pick up on like myself and others and be like, oh, that could be better, slightly this that you know, like all these little things. But that's just being hyper nerd, and it's it's really not. That would help the end product, but again, like I'm sure that if I noticed it, I'm sure the artist did too, but they just didn't have the time to like or the money or whatever, the both usually, to put any more time and effort and money into it. So they got the best that they could for the time they had. Um, but overall, like holy shit, man. Like you can there are certain shots where it just looks like Michael B. Jordan was filmed as a real person. And there's and there's so much expression going on in his face, too. I mean, he's exhaling, he's sweating, he's He's, his brows are furrowing, his eyes are darting all over the place, and everything is just working in concert so beautifully. And uh, the lighting is great. Like, just just phenomenal. So, definitely, I don't know if they always play in the same order for everybody, because someone told me that they were, they were random in the first one. I don't think so, but I think it's like the second to the last episode. One of those. It's, it's in the middle somewhere. Middle toward the end. Um... But watch all of them. I think they were they were all like incredibly well done and just man, the human faces in in that, especially Michael B. Jordan's face, like holy cow, wow, wow. Like I had to keep telling myself, is that real? Like did they did they just film him and composite CG around him? And I'm like, no, that's definitely CG. But but holy crap, like wow, like such a good job. So I don't know if any of you have seen that yet, but um, let me know what you guys thought because I I was blown away. I was like, this is just incredible. Um. Space Jam. <laughs> no, we're not talking about Space Jam. Um, <laughs> Lucky 13? Is that what it was called? I don't even remember the titles of the... I don't remember seeing the titles very much. Maybe they show it. They just, I just didn't register. But it's it's the one where, yeah, he's an astronaut. Like an astronaut space marine guy um, that crash lands on a planet and has to survive with a new threat that, that he finds. And it's um, really good. It's a really good... It's very succinct. Obviously, it's a short film. It's 18 minutes, but it really communicates something. And while like even the antagonist doesn't feel very original, honestly, it feels a lot like, semi-spoiler alert, it's a robot. The robot is drone robot that kind of, I shouldn't say drone, it's, just, it's a robot. That's kind of dog slash humanoid-ish. It really feels a lot like the robot we saw in Red Planet with Val Kilmer, Carrie Ann Moss, what's his name? Um... I think of his name right now. He's a funny actor. He's great. He always plays like an Italian guy. He's like an Italian mobsterish kind of actor. I can't think of his name right now, but great actor too. He dies from like these nematodes. Like they're really like uh, flammable. He just like burns himself up with them. It's, there's some really cool deaths in action, but there's a robot in, in Red Planet that's a very cool, very threatening. And it, it feels like this was a total rip off of that robot. Um, not that's a really a bad thing. Cause I mean, the robot's pretty cool. Um, it's, it's like, a cat dog slash cheetah sort of looking thing. Um, and uh, yeah, that's the antagonist that Michael B. Jordan's character encounters in this short on uh, Love, Death, and Robots. And so that's my only critique would be that the design doesn't feel very original at all. It feels extremely ripped off from Red Planet. Um, and Red Planet was very cool because I think could really like roll up into a really compact, like almost like a suitcase kind of carrying form. And then like unfurl because all the joints can you know go to extreme folding like you know 90 degrees in either direction that kind of stuff so it could like invert itself and like flip over or just like flip on its other side and rotate its head to be like right side up again like all kinds of really cool you know uh biologically impossible maneuvers that robots could obviously do um for real but anyway minor critique because it's still a great design so whether they ripped it off and hopefully whoever whoever owns red planet doesn't like sue them or get pissed or anything Unless they got permission to use it, because it feels so close to Red Planet's um, dog robot. But anyway, awesome short. Check it out if you haven't. It's on Netflix. Pretty freaking cool. Um, so anyway, back to this. Uh, trying to match these up with... Trying to match these up with the uh, shot. And my camera's totally off me, because I'm at an odd angle. So let me adjust this.
There we go. I think it works a little bit better. Sorry, I know it's like I'm always looking down anyway, but whatever. You're not, you're not here to see me. <laughs> you're here to see what I'm working on. Um, so yeah, no. Um, so 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 it's funny. I was laughing at Space Jam, but then then I remembered you. I'm saying Michael B. Jordan, uh, letter B. So it's not Michael Jordan, the actor, the ba basketball player, I should say, but Michael B. Jordan, the actor from creed and uh i mean he was i guess he got his big breakout that i remember seeing him in in um uh what's it called with the other two actors who i can't think of their names either it's terrible but they all kind of spread off from a uh, chronicle there we go the movie chronicle which is like kids finding a power gaining superpowers but like in a really realistic way in a documentary kind of way too um and i normally don't like like documentary kind of like blair witchish kind of like handheld camera films at all like i really hate most of them actually um really dislike them because they're just usually bad acting it's usually not compelling and you just roll your eyes and i'm like why am i even watching five minutes of this because uh, my life is better spent doing anything else but uh chronicle was fantastic i thought overall um yeah i mean it could have been better here and there whatever but um i mean for sure it could have been improved here and there but overall i really enjoyed it and it was a very um very realistic like just it, it portrayed teenagers how i think a lot of teenagers would act in what they would do if they were able to do a lot of the things that you know uh, you saw them doing in the uh in the movie if you haven't seen chronicle highly recommend it check it out um it's definitely uh worth your time i think if you even if you don't like superhero films because i'm even not like i said before i'm not a big superhero guy um it's it's one of those films that's just done very believably and it's well acted and it's um it's interesting it's just very interesting um i thought and i would i would almost like to see i'd almost like to see a sequel kind of but um i don't think i mean they'd really have to stretch some things to make a sequel i think and so it's probably never going to happen um but yeah as a one-off film still it was it was cool it was fun yeah so yeah check it out um but yeah, so Michael B. Jordan got his start there, from what I know. I mean, I'm sure he's probably been in some other things before that, but that's what I think was his big breakout film. And uh, and then from there, I forget what else he did. I'm sure he's done a few other things. But then, like, another big film that everyone really um, recognized him in was uh, Creed. Um, uh, Creed 1 and 2, both great. Uh, and that, and most recently, the thing I think that most people have seen him in now or are aware of is uh, "Without Remorse," Tom Clancy uh, story that um, he does a pretty good job in. I know a lot of people too have been kind of like giving it sort of mediocre reviews, but it's a fun flick. I think it's a fun action movie. You know, nothing that's gonna like earth shatteringly change anything, but it's competently shot and competently done. And if you want some good action, you know, if you're a fan of Call of Duty or you're a fan of Tom Clancy, you want some. some good run and gun you know semi espionage like action with gunplay and some pretty cool scenes here and there i mean like yeah well check it out without remorse it's on amazon um i think it's yeah if you have a prime account you can watch it for free pretty cool i enjoyed it as somebody who doesn't like wasting their time like i don't sit around and just watch anything like i don't watch garbage like i don't watch a lot of stuff that I don't watch a lot of shows, first of all. Um, I mostly watch films, movies, and uh, I don't, I don't like to waste time watching anything that is not, it doesn't have a high production value or isn't a quality story. It doesn't have to be like a, you know, like a, I mean, like anything from video games to movies to books. Like it doesn't have to be a triple A game. It doesn't have to be like the New York Times bestseller. Don't really care about those things. It doesn't have to be an Oscar winning film. It can be an independent film. It can be a foreign film. It could have to read subtitles for the whole thing. I don't care. I just want a great story, like intelligent writing, good emotion. And then after all that is the baseline, anything else on top is, is the icing on top. Um, but it could be any genre of a film too. Granted, I think most genres don't have great films. There's, I mean, each one has a little bit, right? Each one has its, its own gem here and there, you know, or like obviously the adventure films or blockbusters can have more of those because they're just bigger encompassing films. But you know, there's great dramas, there's great comedies, there's like, I like every genre. So it's just a matter of, you know, is a film, does a film have a good story? You know, does it have good writing? Uh, and so that's where, that's where I find films that, you know, I that's what I would consider, you know, it's worth someone's time. So Chronicle, yeah, I think it's worth your time. Um, if you're, again, I look at like Chronicles in between, but like um, Without Remorse, I would say is something that's, it's a bit more of like, kind of like a guilty pleasure to some degree. Um, 
unfortunately. Like, I think it could have been even better, I think, if they would have taken it um, just in a slightly different route here and there. But otherwise, it's um, it's, still, it's still a fun film. It's still a good time. I think all the actors did a good job. And, uh, yeah, it's cool. I mean, I'm a fan of Tom Clancy's stuff, too, though, man. Like, another favorite action film of mine would be um, uh, Patriot Games with Harrison Ford. And I can't remember the actress's name who plays his wife, but she's fantastic, too. She's she's great. She plays such a sharp, intelligent, yet feminine and sexy, but mature, you know, just all... I mean, don't mature, like, el- like age-wise. I just mean, like, mature psychologically, um, mentally. Just a great, attractive, strong woman, and yet also, like, a vulnerable wife, and she's a doctor, and just, just well-written. Just a great written character to complement Harrison Ford's um, Jack Ryan. Um, so if you haven't seen Patriot Games, Sean Bean's in there, Harrison Ford, actress who plays <laughs> his wife, uh, and even the little girl who's his daughter. She's really sweet and very cute, very well done actress, like a very good actress in, in her own right as a child. She did a great job. Um, and a British actor who plays the prime minister in that film as well. I can't remember his name either, but he's he's known. Samuel Jackson's in there too. And freaking, um, uh, my God, Mufasa's voice. Um <laughs> James Earl Jones. James Earl Jones is like the director of the CIA, I think, or something. He's awesome. Just so good. So cool. Like, so many good actors in that movie. So, yeah, if you haven't seen Patriot Games, like, what are you doing with your life? Go watch Patriot Games. So freaking good. I grew up with that film. Like, I was like, as soon as it was on VHS, my dad rented it, and I watched it as a kid, and I was hooked. I was like, dude, Harrison Ford can do no wrong. Like, <laughs> Harrison Ford's the man. Um, he's like a legend. You know, you can't you can't go wrong. It's hard to go wrong with Harrison Ford. Like, he's he's done so many great movies. Um, granted, we won't talk about, uh, the dog movie he did recently with, what's, I forget, what's it called? Called Nature, Nature, Call, I forget, Call the Wild, I forget what it's called. Yeah, I think it was Call the Wild. Sorry to say, I've, I just, the, uh, the dog animation is what, what kills it. It's unfortunate, because I know Chris, I've met Chris Sanders multiple times, um, and I love Chris Sanders. I love a lot of his work. I love his designs. I'm a huge fan of Ogo the Cat. If you go on my website, you'll see I made a little, a 3D print of his cat and gave that to him. That's another time I met a director who I really admire, who I just gave him a little... A little something. Um, granted, I'm not, again, like, I love all kinds of films, but I'm not, like, somebody who ever really wants to work in animation, like, CGI style, like, DreamWorks or, you know, um, Disney style, really, because it's not my, it's not my like, it's not my love. Um, I'll enjoy those films for sure, and there's a couple recent ones I enjoyed, um, but I'm not, like, a sellout for Disney either, like, I don't love everything they make. Um, Lion King, the original Lion King, um, is still one of my favorites. Aladdin is great. Um, Big Hero 6, uh, Zootopia, love Zootopia, Tangled, thought Tangled was awesome, not a big fan of Frozen, Moana, meh, but those are properties that, um, I worked on some toys for, for Moana, which was, which was fun. I actually worked on the toys that were the, the best characters, in my opinion, in Moana, which are the little, um, what do they call them, the Kakimura, I think, I think that's what they call them, like the little coconut bad guys that show up like pirates, and they don't really talk, they just sort of scream and yell and throw spears and have all these funny expressions on their face i love those guys those are very those are very fun fun little characters um but yeah so anyway you know i like some of the animation uh that's out there but but in general i never gave chris anything to as a as a way of trying to like hey let me work for you at some point or anything it was just it's just i loved his character the cat ogo so much that i just it's a little comic he made a little comic strip that he made a while back and i bought the books of it and um just like it's a small like three volume thing or four volume thing um but uh one one book with like several volumes in it and um just a really it's like a cat who's really mischievous and sarcastic and kind of like um i don't know like an updated garfield i guess you could kind of say sort of like he just loves to get into trouble kind of has the looks and elements of like stitch from lilo and stitch you know because stitch was mischievous and kind of like you know just doing whatever he wants um the cat kind of has the same attitude really snarky you know and funny but cute um so anyway, sorry, I'm rambling as you're, I'm trying to figure out the shades because I feel like as I'm matching up one of these with the other, it seems like they're, it's a little too long. I think they maybe need to be brought in. But then when I think about bringing them in, maybe it's the problem is because when I match it up to, um, so let me save this as, as uh, a view two and then I'll, uh, oh, wait, I got to load this views, I think first. So, all right. So these saved views that lock to the photo here. Um, here, hopefully it's not number two, and I'll save this as two, and then if I hit one, yeah. So here's where, 
I don't want to fade out there, but I want to fade the model. It's hard to tell. Even when I put the model in almost total transparency, it's hard to um it's hard to see through because the glasses are black too, so uh, I guess I can do this. Um There we go. Okay, so. See, that's the thing. It's like at this angle, they match. But then from the side, the curve, I think it's it's somehow, it's got to be the curve, right? It's got to be the curvature that's throwing them off, I think. Because I can still keep them at this angle and then push them back, push the end points of the glasses back. And that would still match this view. But then from the side, that's where it would have to be foreshortened, I guess, in a way. Because uh, then if we go back to view two, that's what's missing. So it's almost like they have to be shrunken along the same axis that they are currently at. So, yeah. Hmm. Interesting challenge. And also, I guess, widened a little bit. So I think they're widening. Because this is more of a really good side view. This and the original front view, he's tilted down slightly. Excuse me, so that creates a foreshortening of the glasses, so that actually makes them look a little bit um, shorter than they would if, if viewed more orthographically, more side, like straight on sideways, which is what we have here. So I think, I think that's what I will do. Now the challenge is um, they're off center, so it's like I'm going to have to do them sort of independently. Or what I could do is just do one and then mirror it. Yeah, that's what I'll do. Let's do this one. Duplicate it, mirror it over, delete the other one, and then after I place this one in the same space. So, um, so sorry, I, I, my periphery. I saw that there was a chat. I just didn't get to it yet. Sorry, one sec. Uh, Oh yeah, that's right. So this has to be masked and hidden. And now, now it'll zero out there. Yeah. Okay. And invert mask. mask. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Uh, so what are we saying? Um, sorry, let me catch up on chat really quick. Make a Twitch controlled 3D printer using OBJ files. I saw Chronicle recently and liked it. Yeah, right? It's fun. Uh, any tips on how to verify if the camera's focal matches the image reference? I don't know that there's really a way to verify it other than, like I said, like if you're like, it, it, I especially lucked out with this particular piece because I had that scan from the game from, from Keanu's face. So it has his, you know, overall pretty close to his skin level or I mean, close to poor detail, but not quite, of course, but it's, you know, his full volume of his head is accurate, obviously, like within margin. So that let me match that up to this general shape from this angle. So it clued me into like, it's pretty close to about a hundred millimeter lens, probably, you know, could be plus or minus. I could have used maybe like a 90 millimeter for some reason or a hundred and something millimeter, but it was so close. And at this point it looks right and it matches his volume of his face. So I figure like probably it was a hundred millimeter lens. So, or around there, you know, maybe, I don't know that 150, I think 100, if you went to 150, you would see more compression in the face. And I think it wouldn't match quite as right. So I think I nailed it. I think I did for, for verifying that way. But yeah, I don't really know of any way to really be able to match and know unless the image you downloaded was somehow from the actual 
either it was either that the metadata that was taken with a digital photo with the digital camera had endured through whatever process from the original camera photo image to through Photoshop, through editing, and then output it as a, a JPEG for stills for promotion of that film or that shot. If that somehow carried the metadata from the camera, which it most likely wouldn't, it would get deleted somewhere along the way, either intentionally or unintentionally, usually intentionally, I would think. Um, but if there was a way to verify, like either we get to know like what lens they filmed with, or if like Sony cameras, their images, like I have, I use a Sony a6500, so it's a little older now, but still a decent camera for, for stills and for footage. Not obviously as good as the, the um, you know, the A7, say A7S3 now or whatever, but well aware of all their awesome cameras. But um, a lot of their cameras will carry metadata with the photo. So, and I think you can, somewhere in the settings of the camera, I think you can actually dictate whether or not that's the case, I think. But either way, I know it's it's definitely, it can be there. And uh, a lot of times it is. So when you download the photo from your camera onto your computer and start doing editing, you can even open up that photo from that camera in Photoshop and it will give you, and I don't use Lightroom, but I'm sure probably Lightroom has the same, if not more advanced um, uh, compatibility sensors. But uh, in in Photoshop, it will detect what, um, it can detect what camera was, the image was shot with. And because the images often carry that metadata and then you can just select or you can manually select you know which camera you use because we'll have a drop down of like a lot of camera lenses and a lot of cameras that you could shoot with and then you just choose your camera choose your focal length of the lens you used you can even give you specifically like the zeiss you know specifically zeiss lens 105 you know or whatever like or your you know zeiss um whatever it is like 24 to 70 millimeter lens like that you know um they have all these very specific like you know because there is a limited amount of lenses for each camera it's not like there's just like an endless number um of course you can mix mix and match stuff depending on their connections too you can get like you know a, i don't know whichever lens it's not sony you know directly you can get like some off-brand lens or a brand that's that's not normally compatible with sony you get an adapter and then connect them but then you don't get like your you know by wire you know electric con control of the lens typically not through the camera anyway, you'd have to get like an external, like um, I have a gimbal that has the attachments that will then allow you to independently control focus and um, zoom, you know, and you can, you can do that. Um, but usually then when you have an off brand or non, non directly compatible lens, that's with electric, you know, electrically connected um, zoom and whatnot, you won't be able to do that through the camera. So it's little caveats, but um, anyway, um, so those are the only ways you could find out really or figure out is if you knew either you knew the camera and lens that was originally shot with find the cinematographer you, you could probably you know it's not that far of a stretch to think you could actually stalk <laughs> you could find online the cinematographer or the the onset photographer who worked for a film or worked for whatever image you're trying to find you can usually track them down and interestingly if you could if you have the opportunity and they can read a direct message from you or an email a lot of times they're really kind and if there's nothing that's like you know i don't see why they would be like violating any kind of nda or anything just asking what focal length they shot with if they remember or if they have those notes or if they have access to it and they can tell you i don't see why they wouldn't you know you can you'll be surprised that a lot of people who aren't especially people who aren't the face in the front of a production they're not the director they're not the actor they're not the writer necessarily the writers can be pretty open too but it's usually like the people who are the very top of the the political or not political but the um, public um you know outset face of a brand or of a product or of a movie or whatever if they're not them anyone else below them they're typically people who are working gig to gig like myself and others and usually pretty open to, to friendly to talk to you know people who are up and coming in the industry who are younger or less experienced and who would just like to know certain things they're usually pretty friendly enough to tell you you know it's just not like it's some sort of magic secret or something it's just it was one focal length of one type of lens on a certain type of camera and it's used on probably a lot of other films and used for a lot of other projects all over the place, all over the world. So, um, yeah. So, I mean, if you really wanted to find out and you have the resources to be able to track down someone who is a cinematographer or photographer for a certain production, um, if you can reach out to them, you know, because they often have to field commissions and, and do other things. You know, they're not making typically millions upon millions of dollars for their work. If there's a cinematographer, probably. But um but even so i mean you could these are the kind of people you could bump into on the street if you're here in la or wherever in new york and if you were to talk with them a lot of them are very friendly and they would be more than happy to have a basic conversation with you about the industry or about their work um 
you know, and of course, even some directors and, and, and actors are as well, but they're just a lot harder to get a hold of because of all the layers and barriers of, you know, they're very not, they're not very accessible. They're very inaccessible when it comes to like, you know, send them a direct message or a tweet. You'd be lucky if they were even see it. Um, if they're even looking at that stuff, because a lot of times they have a team, they have publicists, they have agents, they have all these other people that are, are barriers between you and them for direct contact. So it's, uh, it's, you know, not necessarily easy at all to uh, be able to interact with them typically on a normal human level, unless you're friends with them or, you know, the publicist or, you know, whatever. Um, it's just understandable because there's a lot of, there's a lot of wackos out there who, uh, are obsessed with some of these people and, uh, could be very dangerous actually to uh interact with some of them so you gotta be you gotta be careful um it's just uh unfortunately that's the uh the price they must the, the cross they must bear for their fame and money <laughs> but it's it's a it's a realistic it's a realistic danger of course for sure especially for ladies i mean like my god you gotta be careful with the uh, creepy psycho guys out there um uh, but anyway sorry long tangent to say there's not a direct way to find the uh focal length of a camera um it's uh it's it's a bit of a um, it's a bit of a guessing game if you don't have access to the people who actually uh, originally shot the photograph or footage that you're referencing. Um, but if you're if you're really smart too and you're clever, you could even potentially this is be this is a really this is a far shot, but it could happen. I've never tried to do it, but I'm thinking back and like how many I'm just being resourceful. Like how many of the ways could you figure out focal length and what lenses were used? I mean. You could, in theory, watch some behind-the-scenes footage, and if there's any clean, clear shot, which is pretty hard to find, I think, but if you got any clean shots of the cameras, if you're talking about, like, film cameras or, you know, like, digital film cameras for, for, um, for videography, for cinematography, if you see the camera they're using and you can get a glimpse of the, the, the lens they're using, you could, in theory, um, figure out what they, were, what they were filming with, you know, what lens they were using and what focal length it was. Mostly focal length that matters more than anything else in this case. Um, you could figure it out. You could um, for behind the scenes footage, because again, it's not even something that's trying to be concealed. Because it's not like it's some proprietary. It's just a focal length. It's it's one of like several hundred. <laughs> it's that's all it is. It's, it's one of them, um, and it's really not. There's no point to keeping any of that kind of secret. You know what I mean? It's like, what tires did you use to drive this car? Well, it's only one of a limited number, right? Like it's one of them. Um, same thing. It's just it's it's one of those lenses with one of those focal lengths, and maybe they adjust it here or there. But in general, it's you know, you can figure it out. Um, it's, it's, it's information that's not, you know, proprietary or like secret really. Um, so yeah. Um, if you have the determination, if you have the, if you have the will, there's a way, right? That's, that's really what it comes down to is if you got the drive and the determination to try to figure out how and when and who filmed what with what camera, what lens you can, you can get answers. There's also large communities of, you know, cinematographers and filmmakers out there who, are also big nerds about this kind of stuff and could easily um, help you field those kind of questions, you know? So that you go on YouTube even to find some, there's some pretty talented, pretty skilled um, camera centric um, YouTubers who just talk about, and they get to interview cinematographers for major motion pictures. And they get to talk with them about this super nerdy, like nitty gritty information. Um, and I follow some of them. So you could also find out that way. You could talk to some of these people who are obviously like, down the chain from, you know, fame and glory <laughs> and who are just people who are honest workers and who know these people, right? And they could probably either be intermediary for you to ask them or uh, probably have the answers ready because they've interviewed them and talked about certain scenes that are really famous or certain shots that are really famous. And they even break down like what camera they used, what lens they used, what lights they used, what, what the temperature of those lights were, you know, meaning like whether they're warm or cool. All those different things, you know, the Kelvin, the Kelvin temperature. So you can um, you can find a lot of this information. You just got to be resourceful and um, just be a little bit smart about how you source the information or who you're going to source the information information through. Um, but there's there's means there's ways to do this again. So it's not like you just got to guess. I mean, you can you can go through the some logical networking science side of things to uh, to figure out some of these um, some of these really nitty gritty nerdy. Um, questions, but that's in visual effects. It's all about that in the end. Like it all comes down to like attention to detail and very like insanely um, meticulous knowledge of a scene, a shot. Sometimes you don't get all that information, but a good a good visual effects supervisor will be on set. They will be getting lengths, distances, you know, from subject to lens, from subject to 
nearby subject, right? Or secondary person, object, whatever. You're going to have, you know, you're going to be filming a, uh, a gray ball versus a chrome ball, right? You're going to be like getting all that light data information so you can bring it back into the computer. Um, so there's going to be a lot of that information that you can, that you can glean uh, from, uh, that you should be getting, I should say, uh, from set when you're working in visual effects, that it's, it's really imperative to having visual effects composite and look great in a shot. Um, so those are all big, big pieces at play that all come together that wind up be put into the computer in front of somebody like myself, where we have to then pull that information, plug it in, put in the right camera focal length, you know, put in the distance, position the camera in the virtual world in the right position. And then, and then we can like go back and forth and eyeball, like, how is this lining up with a shot? How's it looking like, you know, then you just go back and it's all that just fine detail work of just, you know, a little dance between you, the camera, the digital camera, the, the footage and, and the objects that you're, uh, that you're working on. So it's, it's cool and it's also painstaking <laughs> it's less painstaking when it's it's something that you it's a brand or a project that you love of course that's always the uh that's always the caveat you know it's like anything it's like doing certain things for your family it's not it's not hard at all doing something like similar some similar task for somebody that you're not really connected to at all emotionally a lot harder sometimes so you know just uh realities of <laughs> being human um, sorry, I'm just belligerent the point, and I'm past four now, so it's like I gotta get off here. Actually, it's been a lot of talking. Um, what else are we saying here? Um, so yeah, low gain Ben. That was my long answer to you. I'm sorry. Um, Augustus is saying they are really not going to do a sequel. Uh, yeah, I mean, I heard that the uh, the third one that's that's been greenlit is more of like a spinoff which I guess could be good or could be bad, but I'm, I'm glad they at least did these two films that John was willing to come back and do the second one the way he envisioned it um, with the ideas he kind of came up with because I, I thought the second one was awesome. And if they never do a third one that really ties up the Abbott story, I think they still did such a great job where they could really just, they could go off of this and have it be where, you know, whether it's a military or other people are, are discovering the signal and how to use it. Sorry, slight spoiler alert, um, but, you know, from her hearing aid. Um, it could just go off and figure out how to take it from there. And that would be a logical kind of jumping off point to go into a third one. So I don't know, you know, Jeff Nichols is a great director. I like a lot of his movies. Um, mud was great. You know, I'd be so cool if he brought Matthew McConaughey, Matthew McConaughey, ugh, can't talk into the third one, uh, because that would bring some awesome star power. And I love Matthew McConaughey's work. I think I like him as a person from what I've seen and read. And, and I, like, I recently listened to his whole book, green lights, fantastic, really inspiring. Uh, I still like the guy. Like he seems like a really great guy, a really good actor, and um, good person. And um, Mud was great. I thought Mud was really good. Um, Midnight Special was great. Um, Take Shelter was great. Like I mean, yeah, Jeff Jeff has done some really brilliant, powerful movies, and even his aesthetic and placement of choices of shooting in a lot of those films are very similar to the same outdoors, you know. Um, just people in touch with nature. Like there's a lot of those elements to that in his films too. So I think his palette, his mind, his tastes align very well with A Quiet Place. So it sounds like they're in pretty good hands. And if the fact that John said, I mean, of course, I would think that they probably are obligated to sort of say something positive, but it, I don't think that John would necessarily say this probably unless he meant it, but he said he was blown away by what Jeff has come up with for the third one. So who knows? I mean, it could be a very exciting new new chapter in the whole franchise i just hope like any good series of films they just don't beat a dead horse you know i just hope that they have the uh i hope paramount and the people who are you know working with that whole franchise will have the the mindfulness to say all right we're, we're reaching a climax we're reaching a point here that's let's cap it off and let's end on a high note let's not you know make six more of these movies and then it just becomes I don't know, like Saw or some other, you know, like any other horror franchise that just has like umpteen different films of it and they just become terrible and just like cringy bad. So I, I really pray and hope they, they protect this brand and don't and don't poo poo it. <laughs> um, Daniel G's your Russian movie critiques. Yep. Sorry. <laughs> um, sorry, not sorry. <laughs> uh, you mentioned you had to fly by the seat of your pants in your A Quiet Place 3D project. If you were to do the same with this Neo project, how long would it take to finish to give to Keanu? Good question. Um, if I had to, if I had to fly by the seat of my pants, how long would this take? Um, yeah, if I had to rush this, um, I mean, realistically, to take the finish to print and not have it be a s tiny little thing, but be one six scale, which is what I want to do. 
I would say at least probably another like four weeks, probably another month, maybe or so. If I was just like, you know, not just working on it on stream, which I'm barely doing now because I'm talking so much. Um, but yeah, I think it'd probably be like a good month to be fair, to be safe. And that would still be like flying by the seat of my pants because there's the amount of the, the amount of detail. You know what I mean? Like you see that strap here and this, the stitching in it. Like I want to put all that in there. You know what I mean? Like I want everything to be right on point. It wouldn't be um, it wouldn't be anything that would be half done by any means, you know. Um, but I think the most crucial part here is this face. That's the that's the pivotal of everything. It's a likeness. Once that's there, everything else is it's going to be pretty fast, I think, because the guy's face generic doesn't matter because he's going to be smashed and all the ripples in his face will be cool. Um, the coat and everything else, basic, you know, simple stuff. It's not it's not really that overly complex necessarily. Um, yeah. So, um, t -t 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 Logan Ben is asking, is it live? I mean, yes, this is live. Um, I should get going here though, because we're at four seventeen. Um, great collection of movie screenshots with all the information regarding these. Oh wow, cool. So shotdeck.com. Very cool. Thanks for that. I will check that out. That is awesome. That's so cool that something like that exists. It makes sense. I mean, I, these are such common questions that I think so many must, so many people must have for various reasons, whether it's um, for anything like in my field, but more so, I think it'd just be for other people getting into cinematography, right? That they would be curious to know. And just, this is such a great educational tool then if you have all that information. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you. I'm going to note that right now. Movie shot. Reference site. All right. Um, so anyway, I should wrap it up here because I think we have someone else coming on at five, if I'm not mistaken. Um, Comics Legend, thank you. Appreciate that. It's awesome. Um, Mr. or Miss Rodriguez, thank you. Uh, if, if, okay, so yeah, okay, Barcelona, Spain. Nice. All right. Very cool. Barcelona. Uh, I, uh, interesting. My, my heritage is from Lyon, which is where I get my last name from, north of Madrid. Um, I've never been to there, but my mom and my sister have, and they say it's beautiful and amazing. Uh, but yeah, that's where my ancestors, um, called home and they set roots there as Jews escaping persecution from Rome back in like, I don't know, 18th century or something, um, or early 19th century. So that's where my heritage is. It's Jewish, Spanish. <laughs> so interesting. Um, but yeah, hola. Uh, anyhow, uh, before I wrap up, I'm just going to give you guys my social media spiel for those who are new or interested or who haven't joined. I'll be posting that making a video um, that I was showing you guys earlier uh, for the Creature from a Quiet Place. I'll be posting that on my YouTube channel um, later today, probably later, later today, like evening my time. It's about 4.30 here almost, um, 4.20. Um, but you can find that on my YouTube channel, which would be just youtube.com slash it's either i forget how they orient their let me check that quick i forget how they do their website uh their web like their linking for channels if it's just youtube slash daniel lion arts or if it's um youtube slash user that you know because I, I don't know every every site's a little different let me see here quick um let's see here yeah that works okay so yeah, I'll be posting that on my YouTube channel and wherever else I can afterwards. But this is my this is my YouTube channel. You can hop on there for that. Um, of course, my website, just lion-arts.com. You can see some of the renders for this creature on there too. They're all in red, but I'll do some gray ones with it, you know, from the video. And after this, I'll do some photographs of the actual print to uh, toss up there and probably take on some of the red ones because there's so many. Um, you can email me, please, at daniel at lionarts.com. And please follow me on Instagram and or Twitter. Um, I had an old Twitter account that has more followers on it, but I've it, it had a mixture of all these different things on it. So I just want to keep things more like art centric and just just you know, because Twitter can become a wasteland for like politics and arguing and not that I really engage in any arguing at all. But, you know, just don't just don't need all that other engagement on the old Twitter that I was using. So uh, new Twitter. And this is also the same for Instagram. It's all the same. Lion Arts, Daniel Lion Arts dot com or Daniel Lion Arts. Excuse me. Yeah, tired. Um, so this is Twitter and IG. So you can follow me on there. And uh, yeah, I think that's that's about it. I am still working toward finishing my podcast, the first episode. 
Uh, again, it's with sound designer and extraordinaire, as well as musician and artist, uh, Derek Espino. He's the sound designer for The Last of Us, for Sony PlayStation's games that, The Last Guardian, one of my favorites, as well as, um, man, what else did he work on? Just so much. He worked on Friday Night Lights. That was a big deal. Um, he's worked on a couple of different movies. He worked on sound sourcing, I think, for um, Noah, that movie with Russell Crowe and uh, a bunch of other stuff so we talk about all of that and uh, it's my first podcast so um i think you know things flowed pretty well i probably could be a little bit more concise here and there but overall um, it was a good first episode i have some other people lined up uh, i gotta get them filmed here soon and then put that together but yeah i'm uh, in the middle of editing that should be out this month should be out in june for sure and then hopefully in july i'll have someone else already filmed by then and we can go with them and just so on and so forth so yeah, this it's just about creators and scientists. So it's just the arts and science. It's all my two basic interests. My two big interests are converging with this podcast. So it's just interviews with people I find fascinating and interesting and that I'm either a fan of or, you know, uh, they are involved in something that I'm very interested in as well. So uh, yeah, stay tuned for that. I'll post more of that on my Instagram so you can always find out when that's coming out there. Um, I'll probably share that on my Twitter as well. Um, but yeah, anyway, sorry for going overboard, but I think we're still good on time. So anyhow, thanks for hanging out. Thanks for asking questions and listening to me ramble. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, take care, stay well, stay safe. And I will see all of you, ladies and gentlemen, in the near future.